We're in the home of Dick Rennick in Pinecrest. We are doing an interview for the Pinecrest Pioneers Archive. My name is Kathy Hirsch, and today's date is September 18th, 2015. Would you like to talk a little bit about your family history so we know who you are? <laughs> oh, thank you. I think I'd start with my wonderful mother, who, uh, by the way, lived to be over 99. And uh, we miss her, of course, but she had a wonderful life. And uh, father and mother uh, became uh, separated and finally divorced. And I, was, I was born up in the Bronx, New York, back on October 14, 1930. So mother came down in a 1936 Cadillac convertible all the way to Miami and uh, to grandma's house who lived out in Hialeah, Florida. And at that, that time, uh, my grandfather, John Francis DeWire, I just retired out of the New York Police Department. He was a very popular police inspector, John Francis DeWire, who came from Killarney on Cork County in Ireland. He was born in 19, pardon me, 1872. So he and his younger brother ran away from home and came to the States when they were just little boys and they worked as cabin boys. It sounds like a story you read about, but it really happened. So they both became uh, active in sea duty and they became ensigns in the United States Navy. And uh, during that time, a grandfather had the pleasure of uh, going to Cuba to free Cuba from Spain. And that's where he met Teddy Roosevelt. So Teddy Roosevelt, uh, they became friends and uh, Teddy Roosevelt was the police commissioner of New York City at the time, so he talked grandfather into coming over, giving up the sea, and coming over and uh, getting a job working for the future president, Theodore Roosevelt. So grandfather did it, and uh, he started as a patrolman, worked his way up to be one of the chief inspectors in his area was the theatrical district, and at that time prohibition was on, so uh, his job was to find the stills, and there were many of them. That's where you heard the expression bathtub gin, and then figured out a way to beat the system. And he was the, uh, the theatrical part of his uh, district, and there's also the red light district. So he had his uh, job cut out for him, and. Uh, Every time there was going to be a raid, the New York police would, after the raid was over, they'd say there was that big, burly Irishman with a walrus mustache doing another bust up for the uh, prohibition and uh, what have you. So, so he must have had some pretty wild stories to tell. Uh, and I the Irish have, are good storytellers. Oh, yes. Well, he, uh, uh, unfortunately, after he retired, he was one of the early uh, builders in Hialeah. At that time, Hialeah was just a blanket of uh, trees and palmettos, and that was about it. But he built Grandma a beautiful two-story stucco home, and it was a uh, Spanish theme, and it was beautiful. So that's where Mother, when we came, we lived with Grandma. Uh, grandfather died in an accident. He was doing something he shouldn't have, trying to replace the screen on the second floor and lost his balance and they found him dead the next morning, the newspaper boy. So uh, his life was cut short at 71, but I remember him briefly as a little kid of six or seven years old. And uh, he was big in those days. <laughs> so uh, Hialeah was not built up at all? It was deserted really. And, uh, 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 I, Did you grow up there? I uh, attended Highly Elementary School, and I thought it was strange. Here were a lot of boys that uh, weren't wearing shoes to school, barefooted. I thought, wow. And that was it. it was, people were really poor in those days. They couldn't afford a pair of shoes. And uh, people right down the street from grandma's, they didn't even have electricity. They had uh, oil lamps and what have you. and. Uh, uh, we started at uh, Hialeah Elementary, my two brothers, my good brothers, Robert, 
We served with distinction on the Dade County School Board as chairman and also spent 24 years on the school board. And his uh, area of uh, expertise was helping the young youngsters that they call them incorrigible, these kids that uh, get in trouble. So they have a school named after Robert for those children right now. It's a no-nonsense school. You uh, do what we tell you, or you're going to they're not going to be beaten, or, but you'll be, uh, I guess, restricted of what you can do and can't do. And my uh, good brother Ralph Rennick, he was uh, the first newscaster in the whole state of Florida, and he had that job for 35 years. And probably, uh, uh, you remember his sign off, good night, and may the good news be yours. Well, I wound up later on. Uh, I, out of the Navy with an honorable discharge, Ralph invited me to come down to the studio. That was the only station in the whole state of Florida at the time, WTVJ. It was a CBS affiliate. So while well, I'd never seen a television studio or a television camera in my life, because when I went out to the Pacific to be on board a ship out of Pearl Harbor, right after the war, they didn't have television. So uh, I was just spellbound seeing these lights and cameras and lighting and uh, directing and camera operators. I thought, boy, that's, I'd like to do that. Because when I got out of the Navy, I thought, well, I'll get a job as a bus boy on Miami Beach and go to the University of Miami and, uh, under the GI Bill. But when I saw that studio, I said, uh, Ralph uh, had arranged uh, that when he came down to the studio for the first time, so I had my dress blues on, and uh, he introduced me to the uh, head man at WTVJ, uh, the production manager at that time, Mr. Jack Shea. So the three of us were having lunch, and I said, well, Mr. Shea, did, could I have a job? He said, well, no, because uh, they used to sign on at 4.30 in the afternoon, and they'd sign off at 9.30 at night, and they were mostly uh, what they call kinescopes, little films that had been pre-recorded elsewhere, uh, Shopper's Guide, a cooking show, and what have you. He said, before we finished lunch, he said, uh, Richard, if you'd like to come down and intern uh, without pay, uh, see if you can cut it as a cameraman, uh, we might hire you when we go back earlier in programming. So I said, Mr. Shea, that sounds good to me. So after about two months of uh, doing props, uh, boom operator with the microphones. Uh, uh, you learned just, on the job. How oh, to... I sure did, without pay. <laughs> so they called me in the office on January the 6th, 1951. And they said, Richard, we're going back in programming. So uh, They were offered... not doing programming at the time because of the war? No, no, they were doing minimal, though. Minimal. They'd sign on, like I said, at 4.30 and off at 9.30. Mm -hmm. But the Korean War broke out, and uh, so Ralph was the first newscaster, and uh, they never really had a, a full-time uh, newscast as they do now. Ralph used to do his own processing, little 127 film on a little cartridge back in the men's room, and uh, your husband probably knows about that. <laughs> and, and, so my brother Ralph did it all too, but he deserved whatever he did, and he sure made that station number one in not only the state of Florida, but he was recognized nationally. They offered him jobs up in New York at the big network, but he thought, stay where you are, which he did. And um, so um, they so told me that they hired me finally, and they would pay me $150 a month salary. So uh, I became a rather good camera operator, and uh, so I was on what they called the remote crew. So all the networks needed someone to broadcast their shows all over the whole state of Florida, spring training or wide, wide world or uh, any NBC, ABC or CBS or uh, independent stations spring training, you name it. Uh, I was one of the camera operators. So you permanent. did a variety of 
Oh yeah, we did everything Ed Sullivan we used to do. And uh, uh, just so many names, wonderful people that, and I found uh, the whole, then I got into the theater. I was uh, briefly an actor at the Coconut Grove Playhouse and being a Navy veteran, the director said, we have a job film for you, uh, pardon me, a space for you on the show Mr. Roberts. <laughs> so that was, I said, oh, that's great. <laughs> so here I am, uh, I played the part of Gerhardt and uh, I enjoyed it with the guys. The uh, prop men designed a cargo net and the opening scene and Mr. Roberts are all drunk and uh, they're coming in this cargo net <laughs> onto the stage and uh, it was great. I wasn't one of the drunks in the cargo net. <laughs> How, did it have a long run? Oh yeah, I, it was the first paid job I ever had as an th actor. It was probably about very minimal, I forgot. But uh, then I did other productions and uh, it was fun. But I always liked the camera and directing. And I was scared to death to become a director after I'd been a cameraman for years. Uh, I kept saying to the production manager, well, I want to learn everything a camera can do so that I'm not going to be making mistakes. Because I, there's, you, can, you can be a cameraman by name and then you can be a camera cinematographer and I wanted to be the best so I knew what a camera can do and what it cannot do. So they made me the chief cameraman and I did all the big shows and... Uh, what sticks out in your mind most memorably? I think the uh, uh, talent of other uh, networks that I'd work. Uh, oh gosh, Charlton Heston was a wonderful man. We went over and did Christmas at Ringling Brothers over in Sarasota, I believe. And uh, spring so you training. So with Charlton and Heston? Charlton, who was a wonderful man. Just uh, Most actors are great. The only person I really didn't get along with, I used to work on Miami Vice. It was uh, one of the stars. You're not going to name which one. <laughs> <laughs> there were only two. And uh, Eddie Almos was my good friend. He played Captain Castile. And uh, they had the uh, Emmy Awards for the best new uh, series re relating to uh, police work. So the uh, guy's initials was DJ. Just knew he was going to win it. So he was out in California in center row six and Eddie almost was home asleep here in Miami with his family and uh, the phone rings. Eddie, you, you just won the Emmy Award for the newest film relating to uh, laws. He said, look, it's two in the morning or three in the morning, you quit kidding around. He said, Eddie, we're telling you, you just won the Emmy Award. And here DJ slunk in his chair, they say, up in, out in L.A. Uh, he just knew he was going to win it. And you but, were out there? No, I was here. Oh, you were here. And okay. there's a very nice uh, compliment that Eddie uh, almost wrote to me. It's over part uh -huh. of the house. But uh, he's still around, and uh, they need, need more actors like uh, Eddie almost. And you were involved in the Flipper series, which was shot here, correct? I, sir, yes, I was. And what was uh, your role there? I was uh, uh, in the lighting department. You know, uh, lighting is a very important part of any production. It's probably the most important, besides sound or having good actors or actresses. And uh, so uh, that's when I got interested in politics, too, because I used to, then I wound up being a director. I'll never forget how that happened. A man named Shannon Wallace grabbed me by the arm and said, Rennick, I want to teach you to be a director. I said, Shannon, come on, I want to learn the camera. He said, you've been saying that for a couple of years. So he literally dragged me up to this little control room, what they call Studio B, and said, sit down. So here were all these monitors in front of me, uh, engineers below, and uh, he said, knows your fader switches, and, to cut the one, camera two or camera three, and boy, I said, this is pretty good. So I caught on that pretty good. So then I became a, a, a good director, I thought. 
because they kept giving more and more shows to do. So in those days, we'd direct weather, news, sports, whatever it was, and remotes. Uh, we used to do the Orange Bowl parade every year for uh, CBS, did the Orange Bowl games. I was one of the key cameramen always on those football games. And, uh, boy, That's that an was, active kind of camera operating, um, doing a football game. You better game. not screw up because everything was live in those days. <laughs> and uh, I, I would make a mistake sometimes with a local show. And uh, I remember one of the engineers said, Rennick, you just screwed up. How can you stay so calm? You know, I'd cut to the wrong camera, catch a cameraman uh, getting into another position. I, I said, I just go calmly on to my next mistake because everyone makes mistakes. No one is perfect. God will tell you that. <laughs> so uh, I enjoy, I have had a great career. And then I was uh, at WTUJ for nine and a half years and I was making more in overtime than I was my base salary. After three months, they raised my salary to $175. And three more months after that, it went to $200. I used to dream of, if I could just make $50 a week for the rest of my life, I'll be happy. I was giving mother $10 a week out of my salary for room and board and uh, helping her. And um, so it's all worked out. And then I, uh, one of the fellows I worked with, his name was Bill Carr. And uh, he was a wonderful man. And uh, he was a Navy veteran, and he luckily escaped with the kamikaze aircraft that the Japanese would, they had a one-way trip, and that was to kill as many Americans as possible. So his hit ship, uh, he was on a destroyer, was hit several times. But uh, anyway, he came back, and he was, uh, got to be a cameraman after being a guide up at the uh, CBS station in New York City. Then he came to Miami. So one t a time he said, Dick, uh, take a ride, ride with me. I'm going to, to the Coconut Grove Playhouse. I said, well, what are you going to the Playhouse for? He said, you'll find out. So he, I go to the backstage. He comes back a couple of five minutes later. See, and he's saying goodbye to the crew, uh, the stage crew. And he said, hey, like this, I came here did what they call a tear out, then set up a new show. He had a check for like $187. I said, this is good enough for me, boy. I want to start doing some theatrical stage production. The setup as a, a crew member, not as an actor. And uh, that's the way I, uh, I got into the theater. That was Actors Playhouse <clears throat> in Coral Gables? Yes. In, no, Coconut Grove. Coconut Grove. Okay. Coconut Grove Playhouse, mm -hmm. and that was a great experience. So I, I really uh, had a great life uh, as a camera operator, uh, director. Uh, my brother Ralph had enough confidence in me that any time he ever went on a trip abroad, he always asked me to be his camera operator and director. I believe you were in Cuba in 1959 when Fidel Castro came down from the mountains. The mountains, right. We got there, uh, Batista had fled January 1 of 1959. So Ralph said, Let's, I want to go over to Havana and interview Castro, who was still up in the mountains. So we got there on the 3rd of January of 1959, and Castro was still up in the mountains. But here are all these young guys with sidearms and beards that were the part of the revolution. And uh, Castro let everybody believe that he was going to free Cuba of a dictatorship. And if the American newspapers, a lot of them, I, I say were responsible for helping him get where he got the press that he got, that he was going to be like a savior to the Cuban people. However, we all saw I told my brother, uh, when Castro gave his first speech outdoors, I set up the camera. We got there about 7 a.m. that morning of the 4th of January or whenever. And uh, then I noticed the 
that uh, there was some scaffolding and CMQ was the National Cuban Television Network, CMQ, and their cameras are up on these platforms. And uh, so the people started coming in to this big uh, opening in front of the presidential palace. The next thing I said, Ralph, uh, there's a spot up on that scaffolding, I'm going to take it. Because I could tell the people were almost going to be drowned out. He said, oh, we're OK. I said, nonsense. Uh, hand me up the tripod and the camera. I'm going to get up there. So I scampered up there, handed me. And the next hour, you couldn't breathe up there. There were so many people, and it was so hot. And Castro made his appearance. He spoke for like five hours. It was so packed tight that people were fainting. And they were so close together, they couldn't even fall. So these volunteers, I guess, they had like a little Red Cross armbands. They were taking the unconscious people and moving them over the heads. They passed the unconscious person to the perimeter of the big opening. And that it just, again and again, hundreds of people, died. you know, I can't believe some of them hadn't perished. So anyway. Uh, so were you up there on the scaffold for five hours? Oh, yeah. I was, I, I, and then uh, there was a, a, when he finally wrapped it up, I, I thought, everybody was sweating like you're soaking wet. And uh, they, uh, someone had, they let a, a white dove loose. And that was when Picasso was. So isn't that nice? So I told my brother, I said, Ralph, this guy's a big phony. He said, Dick, how can you tell? And we just heard the guy. So the next morning, Castro had a press conference. And I said, what do you think now? He said, well, give him a chance. So we'll see what happens. Well, we unfortunately gave him too many chances. He turned the country into an island of communism. And all of the, I've, witnessed the first and filmed the first trials of the uh, people against uh, Castro. Uh, they had the, uh, this sort of like an arena. It was a two-story. And the gallery upstairs were the open to the public. And then the main stage, they had these long tables. And the uh, trial people put their sidearms on a stack on one of the tables, a big stack of 45s, 38s, or whatever. They were all small arm. And uh, there were about 80, 10 of them. And so the first prisoner would come in with a denim jacket with a big P written on the back of the jacket. And uh, so I couldn't understand Spanish, so one of the interrogators from the trial would ask questions and the man would uh, give his side of it. And then they'd look up at the crowd in the gallery and they'd go, remind me of the Roman Forum, the Freedom of the Lions. So this preceded about eight different men gave their reasons and the crowd gave every one of them thumbs down. They were executed that afternoon, every one of them. And then, uh, if I would say, well, Kathy, you were against the revolution and your husband, they'd find out who you were and they'd shoot you right there. They'd tell you to move off the sidewalk and they'd kill you. It was the damnedest thing I ever saw in my life. Uh, and this was reported. Pardon me? This was reported to the United States and around oh, the yeah. world. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But I, uh, I then they wanted me to go film some executions and I think it was Santa Rosa. I said, no way. But I, we uh, went out to some of the prisons, and I remember there's a man named Bill Morgan who believed in the revolution. He thought that Castro was going to free Cuba from Batista and the dictatorship. So he, I said, what are you doing up in the mountains with Castro? He said, well, I believe the guy is going to be good for the Cuban people. Well, after a while, well, the first they gave him a job, he was in charge of a frog farm. He was an American? Yes, an American, Bill Morgan. 
nice guy. The frog farm, they have commercial, you know, they'd sell frog legs and that's that, that was his first job. Then he got wise that Castro was a communist, so he was against the revolution and they found it out. So they threw him in the slammer prison and it was my understanding that when they uh, put him against the wall to execute him, they wanted to put a mask on him and he said, no, I don't need that. So out of spite, the men in the uh, firing squad hit him in the knees first and he dropped to his knees and it was very painful, you can imagine that. And uh, they let him suffer for a while. Then they finished him off. They all hit him in the head. And I thought, boy, uh, his body's still over there. Because he's such a nice guy, I just get emotional thinking how Castro's life was so cheap and so many hundreds of decent people that he executed. And I don't care who knows that I'm against this playing footsies with Castro and his brother and all his henchmen and all of the properties they stole, those people will never get those back. Guess who's living in those mansions and all that people earned their livelihood and had it vacated, fleed, uh, all of the hierarchy of the Castro regime. So what other big stories did you cover with your brother? Well, I, uh, I, I did a lot of the uh, marches, by the way, with Dr. Martin Luther King from the beginning, not with Ralph. I was called again. They said, hey, we'd like to have you uh, be our lighting engineer. Uh, so we'd go to, uh, I didn't go to the Selma. We were like in Americas, Georgia, and Birmingham, Alabama, and other When uh, were you cities. in Birmingham? Were you there for the bombing of the church? Aftermath? No, no, it was before, but after that, right. Uh, but I did see, uh, I remember there were some white people that believed in uh, freedom of the black people, like I do, that uh, they're as good as we are, and the color of your skin shouldn't determine how you're going to live and be looked upon. So, uh, I remember uh, the city, one of the cities, here was a, a march going on and the, the Southern Christian leadership at that time, Andy Young, who became a congressman, and, uh, he was a nice guy, and uh, we worked uh, just with all of those men and women. And uh, Anyway, this parade is going on and we're filming it and this guy, a white guy, sucker punched a white marcher just on the side of his head. So he went down and I thought, damn. So there, he's still on the ground unconscious. So finally he gained consciousness and he stood up again. What do you think he did? He started marching again. It was pretty emotional to see that. Pretty good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, most times when you go out as a newsman, they're not pleasant stories. It's a plane crash or a volcano erupting or uh, earthquakes, um, terrible deaths. Uh, I've seen it all. But I'm. Uh, you saw some inspiring things as well. Mm, oh, I sure did. In fact, I worked for all three networks during the marches. I was uh, first, I think I, I was with ABC, they called me. Then I uh, came home and a little rest and I get a call from uh, uh, NBC. <laughs> and, so uh, were you freelancing? Then? Oh yeah, I sure am. Because I was a member of the, uh, the stage uh, and camera and uh, director's uh, union. In fact, every uh, feature film that you see and every TV series you see is done by uh, the group that I was fortunate enough to just to receive a gold card from, the uh, International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. 
it's quite an honor. I just got my 50-year pin. Wow, congratulations. And, uh, not too many people live that long. <laughs> but I, uh, I'm just uh, proud of what I've done. And uh, Ralph would take me on trips that we'd interview, and I'd film Khrushchev or President Kennedy, uh, uh, Castro we discussed, uh, just so many uh, interesting people. Did you ever interview Martin Luther King? Oh, I'll give you a story. I, uh, we would go to the uh, banquets at the, in these beautiful black churches. So, uh, you know, you're a crew member. You don't talk to talent. Uh, you nod and say hello and thank That's it. You don't do one-on-one -on -one with them ever. So uh, here we're at this church in, uh, I think it was Alabama or Georgia, and they had a big banquet, and the program had a full photo of Dr. Martin Luther King on it. So he was backstage waiting to be introduced before the banquet started. They had preliminary speeches. So I was uh, knew this woman that really felt that Dr. King had a message that was certainly worthwhile, and I did too. And uh, so I don't know what possessed me, but he's closer than I am to you. I said, uh, Dr. King, would you please autograph? Uh, I have a friend that's a very fan of yours and believe in your program of equality. So he kind of hesitated, like, are you, do you really mean it? I said, yeah, I'd be honored. I know she would be. So he had the most flowing handwriting. He wrote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr to, I think her name was Mary, and uh, and I'll never forget that man. He was so pleasant, and just to be in his company like that. Now, a lot of people can say that they heard of him, or they knew him, but there's very few people like Dick Rennick that can say I was one-on-one -on -one with you, like two feet away from you. The same thing went with Khrushchev. I could have killed a guy when we went to, to the uh, Khrushchev Kennedy talks in Vienna. So uh, Ralph said, well, how can we do? I said, I grabbed two occupied seats off the aircraft. And I said, come with me. So I got out where the, uh, the Khrushchev would not fly. He always went by train. So we went to the Bonhof. That's called the uh, train station. So uh, this is a little knoll-like, and there's only one other camera operator. So the police thought I was the press, which I was, but they didn't know I didn't have credentials. <laughs> so I plopped down alongside this guy, a few feet away, set up my camera, and I'm waiting for this Bonhoff at the train station at the Bonhoff to arrive. It was. Premier Khrushchev, and at that time, President Kennedy and Premier Nikita Khrushchev were probably the two most powerful men in the world. So here I've got a, what they call it, it's a telephoto lens. And so I've got the camera all set, because it's quite a distance from where they had the motorcade that was going to take him to start the Khrushchev-Kennedy talks in Vienna. So I could hear the train all of a sudden in the distance. I said, wow, that's it. <laughs> so I hesitated because people started gathering around, the dignitaries, the mayors, and all that from the Vienna, I guess. And uh, so people started getting off the train. I hesitated because I started, was going to start the camera, but I saw, it's not that Khrushchev. So I waited and waited, and then here he is. So I started camera rolling, and he's saying hello to the dignitaries. Then he starts walking towards the motorcade, which is quite a distance. So I did what they do, what they call cutaways. They will get helicopters flying here, or birds there, or just general crowd shots. Then I'd flip to a wider angle lens, cut to him again as he's getting closer, and I did that three or four times. So then I flipped to a, what's called a 10 millimeter lens. It was a fixed focus. So anything you did was in focus. Move it in or out, you got it. 
So here, uh, I believe it was a Ford convertible, so he hesitated to get in the convertible for a minute. So now I'm excited just to be this close to the motorcade. So this other cameraman, he gets down and he's closer. So I said, well, he did, I'm gonna do the same thing. So I jumped down, I took the camera off the tripod and here I am and I'm like two feet away from Khrushchev and then the motorcade bumped me when they started moving and as he pulled back and I, wow, I could have hit him on the head with a camera I was that close. <laughs> but, uh, those are two of the, I've had a lot of exciting things in my life and I just thank God for every one of them. And that particular footage that you shot, what, where oh, that was, was that uh, shown? That was shown nationally on CBS. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Ralph uh, made documentaries. Uh, I, I wish we had them. So, uh, so you freelanced, but your brother brought you in on a lot of trips and things where he was doing documentaries or special coverage. Everyone, in fact, I was his operator. Whoop. Yes, I was honored to do that. Mm -hmm. And what was your relationship like with, with your brother being kind was, of your crew boss? <laughs> well, we uh, got along great. And uh, especially I was directing him and I, I said, Ralph, I want you to do it this way. No, Dick, I don't want it. I said, I'm going to tell mother. <laughs> he said, yeah, right. <laughs> he did it his way. <laughs> But, uh, well, is that a joke between the two of you then? Yeah, we were good brothers. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember the first trip we went to Moscow to, uh, uh, we had like a who's who a group of uh, business leaders from South Florida, uh, Jay and MacArthur, MacArthur Darius, uh, Anthony Abraham, Tony Abraham, from, who did a lot of good for a lot of people. And just uh, Fred Snyde, and just not name dropping, but just everyone was an important person. And uh, I was just proud. I was only 29. I was the youngest guy there. But uh, Ralph had enough confidence that he knew I'd get the job done the way he wanted it. And uh, I had a lot of help too, by the way. You don't do it by yourself. And so I used to direct these politicians, and uh, they'd uh, come back two years later. And they're repeating what they said two years ago. I said, hey, you said that two years ago. Where, where you been, man? You were supposed to get that done. So when they reapportioned, uh, they kept going from, I think they had three state representatives and one or two state senators from Dade County. And it was done back in those days, uh, they called them the pork choppers that uh, controlled the Florida legislature but uh, uh, Dempsey Barron, Senator Dempsey Barron, he helped get the rightful uh, recognition on reapportionment. So we wound up with like 22 House members and eight or nine senators overnight. So I ran for the House, figured, well, I'm ready. Got defeated, ran again, got defeated. So the third time, I said, they don't understand me. And my buddy said, yeah, they do. That's why you're losing. So I ran again, and I got the highest vote anyone ever got in the whole state of Florida as a state representative. How old were you then when you did this? I was uh, 35. And what made you decide to, I guess, get into politics? We can call it that. Right. Well, did I, you uh, think of it as that, or did you think of it as something? I, I thought of it. I could. Uh, I, I felt that I could add something to it mm -hmm. because I. Uh, I was working on the Flipper series and uh, conservation I've always uh, dealt with and uh, a lot of my legislation dealt with conservation. Uh, protection of our coral reefs are totally protected now. Now they're killing the reefs and all the junk they're throwing in the water. I hope that gets rectified. But uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, first time it had ever been done to the knowledge of the clerk of the House of Representatives, they honored me by naming it the uh, State Senator Richard Dick Carl Reef Protection Act. 
So uh, that was, I couldn't, I didn't know it. <laughs> that was nice. Well, something to be proud of. Uh, but uh, you don't do it in the, I always introduce legislation to make it a page or two in the summary included so people could understand. Like uh, uh, hit and run drivers used to be a misdemeanor. If you were caught drunk driving, it was a more severe penalty. So I wasn't, I'm not a lawyer, I'm in the film and television and the theater business. So I uh, said, I'm gonna change that, make it a felony. So that's how that happened. What are some of the other um, legislation that you're proud of? Oh gosh, I, I think one of the most uh, cost-saving measures that I introduced as a House member when I first, about 1967, it's called the uh, Tenant Landlord Security Deposit Act. That, uh, you know, we have thousands and tens of thousands of structures that people put up a security deposit throughout the state of Florida. And uh, uh, at that time, those security deposits were not protected at all. The owners of the structures and the developers could co-mingle those security deposits any way they wanted, go out to Las Vegas, lose gambling with the security deposit money or uh, put it into other ventures that go broke uh, with your security deposits, which had no protection. Many of those uh, multi-millions were wasted. And the bottom line was I was asked by a, a, a member of the Miami Beach Council, I think his name was Herb Magnus, pardon me if I don't recall, he's just long deceased. But he asked me if I would introduce the measure in the House because they had uh, Senator Dick Stone who went on to become a United States Senator and uh, Senator Bob Shevin, who was our Attorney General of Florida for many years. So I'm working the House with the House bill, and Stone and Shevin are over in the Senate. And uh, so after uh, much debate and committee assignment, committee work, I got the bill passed in the House. And the Senators never took any action on it on the Senate side. And uh, I saw they had their aide up in the gallery. So I motioned, I want to see you outside. So I, uh, they were great senators, don't misunderstand me. But they didn't take any action on this very serious bill. So I said, you better tell those senators of yours to get on the ball and get that bill working out of the committees and get it passed in the Senate because we just passed it in the House of Representatives and if you don't, I'm going to expose them. And I don't care who knows it. Guess what? Rapidly, that bill was introduced in the Senate for debate, and it passed. But that came out as a House bill with my name on it. So I was very proud of that. That bill is probably, uh, I, I couldn't begin to imagine the hundreds of millions of dollars statewide that that bill uh, has saved. People now know right where their money is, their security deposits are in safekeeping, they're interest bearing, and the owners, uh, renters I should say, of those units know exactly where it is. And if any damages occur, of course, it's taken out of the security deposit, but they're safe now and interest bearing. So, hooray for our side. <laughs> Did you find you had to kind of be tough to get things done up there? Well, I think in my area it was probably just the opposite. Uh, I always found that toughness and bulliness doesn't count. Just be yourself. So that's why I made up my mind. I said, hey, I'm not as smart as these lawyers that have been up in the Senate for 20 years and House members, there were no term limits in those days. So I just, uh, just, it was a Dick Rennick, honestly, and uh, I never lost a bill in the House or the Senate, by the way, and I was very proud of that. 
a couple of bills were buried I wanted to protect the brown bears of Florida years ago, so they put in some hokey subcommittee in the House, and the guy, I remember him saying, that'll never get out of committee. It didn't. Now they're opening up, they want to start killing our brown bears. Uh, brown bears, by the way, only exist in certain counties in Florida, Collier County being one of them, probably the largest, I think Wakulla County or Franklin County, some of these smaller counties have bears up there. But now they, they call it a harvest. Uh, it's a slaughter is what it is. Uh, no matter what the species is, it, they say they're, uh, it's a harvest. Why are they doing that, allowing that to happen? Well, some people are complaining uh, without, I, I, I can't say without merit, but uh, bears do have to eat. Uh, they should probably take and move those uh, predator bears to uh, larger areas like in the Everglades. Or, uh, well, a lot of property is still left in Florida, I can tell you, that's vacant. Uh, I'm, not, I'm opposed to that one. And uh, I had a tough time uh, getting the car reefs protected, but uh, I didn't slam them and say all car reefs are protected. I just thought, wait a minute, I'm going to do it in portions. So I got a bill passed. I think I said you can take 30 pounds. Then the next session it was 15 pounds. So that's fishing on the coral reefs or? Taking coral. Taking coral. Dynamite. Removing the, it. Taking it. That was the one I mentioned that they named the uh, Coral Reef Protection Act after me the House and the Senate, it has never been done before. Because now our coral reefs, soft corals, or, you know, the fan corals, any species of coral in Florida are protected. And if you're caught, you're gonna get severe penalties and you're gonna go to jail if you're caught the second time. So any corals you see in, for sale of these shell shops, they're probably from the Philippines or some other country who knows where, but they're not coming from Florida, I can tell you that. That's a good bill. There's a lot of pollution that's destroying um, that's coral the coral reefs. It's sure. Uh, you know, uh, everybody, uh, developers want to tear down everything uh, uh, that's got any semblance of our, uh, old residents here, or old hotels, uh, the Kaburi furbished, uh, they're all torn down here. When I, I've been live, living here for 75 years, so I know what I'm talking about in those days. Uh, you could ride horses, just keep going, no barbed wire. Probably went up in Broward County or up above, and uh, no one stopped you. That, uh, uh, let's see. Is there a way for development to occur? I mean, population grows. We have air conditioning here now. It's more hospitable to live here. Um, is there a way to preserve quality of life and grow at the same time? That That's really a hard question, is, isn't it? It's a, such a broad question that I, uh, uh, a lot of people come to Florida because we're a state that has no income tax. We have the uh, temperatures and the freezing up in the Chicago, New York areas. Those, they call them snowbirds, and they like the name, by the way. It's not derogatory. They come down in the uh, winter times and they go back to their homes. But more, you know, senior citizens like living here. We have probably one of the largest group of seniors in the United States. And Florida's a wonderful state. I've been all over Florida. I was on the prisons committee when I was in the house and I went to a lot of the prisons too, by the way, that our uh, uh, legislation to do with uh, prisoners, uh, nonviolent prisoners should be uh, readdressed and uh, uh, you know, nonviolent uh, criminals, if you put away a kid that uh, 
caught with uh, drugs. I'm not in favor of marijuana at all. Uh, I know someone that uses it as medical marijuana. It's helped her a great deal. But uh, I don't know enough about that product. But I do know the overall, uh, from what I read and hear, is that it's, uh, a constant puffing on marijuana, weed, or whatever you want to call it, not good for your health and the people around you either. When I grew up, uh, pot was something you cooked out of, or weed was uh, you pulled them out of the ground. And, uh, A lot of people smoke cigarettes um, in the time you're talking about. Uh, sure, no one, I smoked too when I was in the Navy, and I could buy cigarettes for 60 cents a carton. That's 10 packs. Now, they tell me what well, well, a pack up in New York costs you like 10 or 12 dollars. A pack. And the prison system, by the way, I just visited a friend in prison, and he said what they'll do, they'll take a long cigarette, and they'll cut that in pieces. The full cigarette's about $15. So they'll smuggle that into prison, and then they'll cut pieces of that long cigarette into little joints where you can get two or three puffs on it, and they'll sell that for two or three dollars. So the fifteen dollar, it's like a chain of command. Pretty Hard to profitable. Believe. Pardon me. Pretty profitable. Well, let's talk about um, Pinecrest. How many years have you lived here in Pinecrest? We moved here in September of nineteen sixty-eight. Was that forty-seven, forty-eight years ago? Happy about it. You've seen some changes. Yes, quite a few, in fact, uh, mostly to the good. Uh, what, to be honest with you, bothers me some, uh, greatly, I guess, would be a, a nice residential section of single-story homes and they'll demolish after purchasing a home and build a, what they call a mini mansions, two and three stories high. But nothing I can do. That's by law you can do this, but that's my personal feeling. So I don't speak for everybody. So it's really uh, a zoning matter, really, of what's it allowed. Zoning, right. I think we're gifted right now to have a pretty solid uh, uh, village council. So I had a little disagreement with the mayor on one occasion that uh, involved the uh, Veterans Wayside Park right up here at Killian and US-1. Uh, they wanted to make it into a uh, dog park. So I gathered my troops together and uh, expressed our thoughts to the American Legion and all veterans that said, hey, this is an honor, honoring a war dead, that men and women that gave their lives to make you and me free. And they were hell-bent on making it into a dog park. So I got the troops together. I say, I, we. Everything you do, it's not me, it's we. Remember that. And uh, so I remember that is big committee, and most of the committee were living in Palmetto Bay, which already had a dog park. So they would come over to these village council hearings, and I would be there too with one or two of my veteran friends. And uh, they had one guy dressed as his dogs, and they're barking and yelping, and uh, it just was a sham, really. But I took it very seriously because I knew the bottom line they wanted to take away that honoring our dead. So after 13 months, I, t I talked to the county and uh, some of the uh, county leadership, uh, we took a walk out in the end of Chapman Field Drive and they said, well, there's not enough room here. I said, well, what about that big spa open space way out at the end? They never thought about it. So one of the leaders of the county in the park system walk with me and we walked out there 
and I was telling him, you know, with all these noxious trees, not native, uh, uh, we could get rid of those Mataluca trees, or we'd, the Australian pine trees, and you'd have mangroves on both sides. And the uh, half of the uh, path out there is blacktop, and the other half is the natural coral, multi, many millions of year old. I said, well, why don't we just leave that as it is and let the people, the few potholes, I can arrange with some of my gravel people, we can fill those in with oolite gravel, where people can say that they were driving over millions of year old reef out to the big open space. So this uh, gentleman, uh, we got through walking out to this open space. Uh, <laughs> he said, yeah, this is not even being used. This belongs to the county. So I got a little excited. And before the week was out, I went back out there. They had already marked with where they were going to put these well, stations where your dog, if it had to go papa, cuckoo, caca, poo poo, <laughs> that they could uh, have these containers to get rid of it. And they're there right now within a week. And I said, boy, we're moving right along. <clears throat> and um, that not only uh, is going to be a beautiful park for Pinecrest, for Carl Gables, and Palmetto Bay, and they're already using it. So there's more on the way, folks. Stay tuned. <laughs> it takes a lot of fill to fill one area, but uh, I thank uh, the head of the uh, parks uh, for the state of Florida, or pardon me, for Dade County, Miami-Dade County. <laughs> Miami-Dade County, by the way, used to be Metro-Dade County. And I was the, uh, at the time, the county film commissioner, Mayor Steve yes. Clark, appointed me that job. Tell us so, about that era and what went on there. <laughs> that was a great job. And uh, uh, we would have uh, producers and uh, camera crews come in from all over the world to Metro Dade County. So I, I went to. Uh, the county manager at that time, I don't know whether it's mentioned Joaquino Avino's name or not, but he was the manager. And I said, Joaquin, uh, I'd like to change your name to Miami-Dade County because people come in, they don't know where Metro-Dade County is. It could be Los Angeles or any other place. So he said, that's not a good idea. So I went to Steve Clark. He said, Dick, you're running that office. You do what you want. So I had business cards made. I have caps made I used to give at the film crews in Miami-Dade County. Focus your next production, Miami-Dade County, Florida. And I had an iris. And in the iris showed a sailboat, this palm tree, you want, I'll run and get you one and show it what oh, it looks sure. like. Oh, after, after we're done. Young. So uh, I can prove that's how that name got started. But uh, the manager gave it to uh, Alex Pinellas, who introduced it on the ballot uh, to change the name from Metro to Miami Dade County. Well, I had already changed it about two years before, <laughs> but guess who got all the credit? <laughs> Um, Pinellas. What? Uh, and I'm not offended, but uh, it should have been Miami-Dade County, which it is. Yes, it makes sense. I used to give away t-shirts and hats to the film crews, like I said. So the we had kind of a bustling industry for a while, and then what happened? We used to be number three in the, uh, the whole nation. Florida. It was uh, Los Angeles, number one, because they have all their studios out there and crews. And uh, New York was in the second uh, because they surrounded states who were right there. And Florida was number three for years because we did it uh, 
I used to work on Flipper, General Ben, Miami Vice, PT-109, Hole in the Head with Frank Sinatra. Yes, it goes on and on. And the crews would come in here, the producers, because we have one, th they'd film cloud scenes for a movie made out in LA. They'd fly to Florida to take the cumulus cloud scenes and insert them out in their film. Because LA had too much smog. <laughs> That's uh, funny. That's, that's, that's funny. the truth, though. Uh, to this day, I guess they still do it. So what happened to the film industry here? <clears throat> well, we have no state sales tax. Oh, pardon me. Stop. I was incorrect. Income we tax. We have no state income tax. And Louisiana started it. They uh, had a state income tax. But they'd earmark part of their, out of their general revenue to lure the film industry to come to Louisiana. What do you need, a soundstage or a film production or whatever you need? They give them all of these uh, goodies. So that's why we lost it to them. Then other states got wind of it, Georgia, the Carolinas, the Bahamas. And here we're trying to get by. We had a bill and title only when I was asked to come up and help the film industry, a bill entitled only that had a, an appropriation, but the appropriation was stricken, if you follow that. In other words, they took the money away. They, no budget whatsoever. So under the leadership of Governor Jeb Bush and State Representative Ken Sorensen, and uh, Representative Davis out of Jacksonville, who all believed in the film industry, they got an appropriation for us. The first one was five million. Then I used Ken Sorensen, who was from uh, Isla Mirada, actually, Key Largo, where his home was, and a big help. I said, Ken, why don't we try for 10? I don't know, Dick. I said, just so we got 10 million next year. Then we got out up to 25 million coming in regularly. But that was a token amount. Louisiana is going to give you $100,000, $200,000, and these other states are trying to beat theirs like uh, we got lost in the shovel. So it was a combination of not having finances stop right there. financing uh, through the state a state income tax and then competition from other states. Oh, yes, and because Louisiana had a uh, state income tax and that the general revenue would help out with the industry and give them all these benefits. A lot of films are being shot in Canada too. Yes, that's true. But we still have the climate. We're doing features now and then in the series. There was talk of um, um, the need for more infrastructure here in terms of, um, you know, people would come here and shoot, but they would go back to L.A. to cut. Um, You're right. So, and do studio work. So, but there was a studio here, Ivan Tours. Ivan Tours, I was up there many times with Flipper. And what else was shot there, and why did that decline? Well, we did uh, Flipper up there in the theater. Uh, not only Flipper, but General Ben was up there when I was on that show, as well as other uh, uh, productions that I was not associated with. You know, at that time there was production going on all over South Florida. Uh, why it declines is because of uh, competition, primarily. I have to tell you that uh, people would rather go where they get these benefits and they weren't getting them from Florida. Anything else in the community that you've been active in, in Pinecrest? Well, I, uh, I think they were gifted, like I said earlier, with a uh, Veterans Council now that they're, uh, generally speaking, they're all um, on board for the people that elected them. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I just think Pinecrest is a wonderful place to live. It used to be called East Kendall. In fact, there was an airport right up 125th Street, Brown's Airport. And we used to fly into that and I, with Senator Bob Averfield. I said, you better get this sucker up because we're barely hitting, you know, not barely missing, I should say, the telephone wires and telephone poles. No crash landings, luckily. <laughs> <laughs>